we'll finish up with this. What is God's will is the title of this section here. Um, what is God's will? And we'll see here in John 10.10. 10, it says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. He wasn't talking about earthly treasures. He was talking about life in the Spirit. Abundant life, abundant joy, abundant peace. He said, I've came to the... He said, but the thief, and he's, he's referring to her, the devil. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So when he puts, afflicts you with sickness or disease, sometimes that can lead to death. He's putting death on you. And he's taking the life away from you because death takes away life. It takes away your way of living. It takes away these things. And that's what the, he comes to steal your health, to try to kill your body, your family, and your finances, and to destroy whatever he can do. That's, that's his job. He you got to remember, the devil hates you. You're creating the image of God, and you have what he'll never have again. You know, you have opportunity to be with God. And, and if you're a born-again Christian, he'll never see that. His ultimate, his, his ultimate end is the lake of fire, and he knows that. He knows he has a short time. He's been cast down here on earth to destroy and to, to wreak havoc on God's creation. But through the anointing of God, through the when we get uh, born again, and we're in the body of Christ spiritually, we're, we have that protection over us now, that he can't destroy us. Not that he can't, so he doesn't have power. Jesus says, I have all power and authority, but the devil still has ability. There's things he can still do. He's, that's why he's a thief. A thief breaks in. He comes in even when he don't, he don't have the right. He can do that. And that's where we have to resist him. We have to use our authority against him to stop him when he tries to break in our houses and when he tries to break in and put sickness on. Because we are the temple of God. We are the house. We are the house. And we have to stop his works. And we have the authority to do that. So he has no right to put sickness on anyone. Um, if a thief does not have authority, if he had the authority, he, he wouldn't be a thief. Um, Jesus took the power and authority from him a thief also means false teacher got a lot of them teaching false doctrines and heresies um, and a lot of that they they, they um the, the word of god is null and void to them you know it's it's a uh we'll, we'll get into it in just a second here um first corinthians six twenty. For you were bought with a price, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. He says, glorify God in your body and your spirit. What we, what, how we do that? What we allow to go in our spirit. What you allow to go in your eyes and your ears and the things that you're saying because your words, your words give the devil legal rights over you. And... He says, glorify God in your body and spirit. So don't allow these things into your spirit. It's your job to protect them and to keep them holy, what, what goes in. So it, it matters what you listen to. It matters what you watch. All that stuff matters because that's how the enemy tries to get in your mind and begin to entertain thoughts and things like that and take hold of your mind. Um, and what I was talking about, it's... Um, what religion is, it's like false teaching, it's a form of godliness, but they deny the power. Anybody that denies the power, it's just a religious organization, it's a form of godliness, but they deny the power. If the Holy Spirit's not there, see, that's why, that's why religious organizations have to put rules and regulations on people, because the Holy Spirit is not there bringing the correction and doing the sanctification work that he does. Because the Holy Spirit's there, and we're being led by him, he will cleanse the person by the washing of the water of the word, by dealing with their sin. The Holy Spirit deals with them. That's his job, is to come in and help you through the word um, and the Holy Spirit to bring sanctification to your soul, to begin to uh, restore that, renew your soul. Um, and it's just like, um, it's just like if I was, say I was in a store and I lost my keys, and somebody found the keys. They have the ability now, if they can hit that alarm, but find my car and take off with it. They don't have the right because I own the car. But they actually have the ability now because they got my keys. 
See what I'm saying? The devil has ability, but he don't have any rights. See, just because he has the keys, just the person, just because the person found the keys, doesn't mean he has the permission to take my car, right? And God's will must be that everyone might have life and life abundantly. That that's God's will for you. He wants you to have life in the spirit and life more abundantly. That's what he wants you to have. Not death, not sickness, not disease. 1 John 3, it says, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we see here, just like he wants everyone saved, you are that might. Whether, the, whether or not God's work gets done on the earth is whether or not you step up and do it. He's not going to do it. Jesus took away the enemy's authority on the cross. He spoiled principalities and powers, trampled on them. But like I said, he still has ability. That's why we see these things. That's where we have to, this is where we miss it. If we're not, the Bible says submit to God, submit to him, submit to the word, submit to the Holy Spirit, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. That is the key. He'll, 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 he'll go. So we see that. Psalm 115 and 16, the heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to children of men. He has given you and I this earth. He has formed us from the dust of the earth and says, here, take this, have dominion over it. He's given us ability. He's given us power and authority. Satan took it from us through Adam and Eve, but Jesus brought that power and authority back. Not over people. Over sickness and disease, we have spiritual power and authority over the works of the devil. We have dominion. We're able to exercise that. We're able to, you know, we're able to, when we get born again, now God's dreams becomes my dreams. And whatever those dreams are, God will fulfill them through faith. If it's to have Bible schools, a church where you can, you know, whatever those dreams he's put in you, he will provide that for you. Right? He'll provide for you. You just got to step out in faith. And it don't, see, we want to we microwave fast food ministry. So what do we do? We bypass the wilderness. We bypass the desert time. We bypass all that stuff, and we go to a cemetery. And we learn how to teach the dead people. And now we got churches that are cemeteries, and that's, that's what we do. And instead of going through and allowing the Holy Spirit to take you through the wilderness, take you through the desert times and go through the crushing and go through dying to self and go through that process where when you come out, you are ready. You are anointed. You have power. You have authority. No, we want to do it the fast way. We want to go around, go to school and get all my head knowledge, which absolutely does nobody nothing. The Bible says it's the anointing that destroys the yoke, not your good speech, not your, all your natural abilities, not your knowledge. It is the anointing that breaks yokes. So when we bypass the plan of God for our life to do things our way and have a fast food ministry, we leave out the power of God. We leave out the Holy Spirit. And then people stay in bondage. It's the anointing, the Bible says, that destroys the yoke. And we see here... Um, We're to glorify God in our body, but um, working off two things here. So we, when we read that, he gets children of men. God's will must that the works of the devil be destroyed. Look at Genesis 1, 26 through 28. The next scripture down. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Who's our? The Father and the Son. So he was with him in the beginning. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. And over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. 
And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. If Billy and Bobby are together, you can't fulfill the earth and subdue it. Do you see what I'm saying? And that's what he's saying. So now we got, we got people that are confused, transgender. Look, a boy can't have a, can't have a baby. A male can't have a baby. We got all this stuff going on. Two females can't reproduce. We would, listen, our, mankind in one generation, if everybody was the same sex, they, they had, if they were men married men, and women, we, would, we, would be, we would be desolate in a generation. We would be desolate. But there is denominations, there's preachers now that are ordained, they are gay and they're ordained, and it's not of God. It's the Antichrist spirit. They've been deceived, they've been lied to. Somebody's lied to them, not told them the truth. Um, it's not, that is not God's will. It's not God's will. What's, what's good for one is good for all. It's not God's will that his creation perish. You know, if, if our pigs were gay, we wouldn't have bacon on the table. If our, if our roosters were gay, we wouldn't have eggs. We wouldn't have more. If, if, our, if our cows were gay, we wouldn't have meat on the table. I mean, it's common sense, folks. I mean, you don't, have to, you don't have to know the Bible. If our livestock were gay, we wouldn't, we wouldn't, I mean, everything would, would dry up. So you don't have to even be a, a Bible person to even see that's common sense. That's how God created things. You see what I'm saying? It's, I, don't, I don't understand where we're getting this, but it's an antichrist spirit. It's a perverse spirit, and it needs to be called out. It needs to be called out. Preachers need to, to take, the, take their, get, get some backbone, get some spine, and start preaching what the Bible says and telling people the truth. That's, I, I blame the church for the reason why America is in the condition it's in. I believe the church, church was always the light of, this, of, of the U.S. It was always the light. The light has went dim. The light now, they are in darkness. The churches live in darkness now. And... Unfortunately, and it keeps people in bondage. <clears throat> but when Adam and Eve sinned, we see they lost the keys to the kingdom. And Jesus came. When Jesus came, He took them back from the devil. And um, look at Matthew twenty-eight, eighteen through twenty. It says here, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, "All authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth. All authority, all authority." It's been given to Him. Go therefore and make disciples. He's saying, "So I've been given authority. Now I want you to go." Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. <clears throat> what is making disciples? Making, it's raising people up to look like Jesus. That is the work of the fivefold ministry. Of all, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. What? Teaching them, he's, he, and that's telling, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That's our job. We're to teach you that. Not only are we to teach it, we're to live it. We must live it first. We've got to be the living examples, and then we can teach you all. Because if we're not living it, I don't need to be up there teaching. I don't need somebody preaching to me something that they're not living, something that they're not doing. And most of y'all, a lot of y'all, you've been at my house. You've, you've been to my home. You've been out with us. You know how we live. We, we do this wherever we go. If we're in a restaurant, we pray, we pray for the sick. We pray for our waiter, who, waitress, whoever. It doesn't, this is everywhere we go. We're at the Walmart, we're at the, wherever it's at, this is what we do. This is life. That's it. This is, this is a reality. This is a kingdom life. Not a Baptist life. Not a Pentecostal life. Not a Church of God life. Not a Presbyterian life. Not a Catholic life. This is a kingdom life. It's a kingdom life. And that's how we live it. We operate in it. Sometimes it's not nice. Some, to some people, sometimes I don't look, I'm not very nice. Because I don't, I don't put up with the devil and his works. When the wolves come in, I just shut them down real quick. It, it just, it's just not nice sometimes. But, um, you know, there should be something to stir up on the inside when wolves come in to try to destroy the sheep. There should be something to stir up. You grab that staff of authority and you start using it. And that's, that is where we have failed in the church. We, we have let the wolves come in, and we've quit using authority, and, we, and now, we're trying to, now we're trying to teach the wolves and counsel the wolves. Cast them out. Drive them out. 
And we're going to let them come in and just do whatever. No, drive them out. Drive, you take that rod of authority and run them. That's what, we're, that's what we're called to do. So sometimes when you're following Jesus and you're doing what Jesus said to do, it don't look nice. He come in and tipped the tables over, flipped all the tables over, and the money changer. It, it, was a righteous, it, was, it, it was a righteous anger that he had. He didn't sin. No, he, got tired of, he got tired of his people being abused at the temple. They were robbing. They were robbing his people for the temple sacrifice, charging too much, overcharging people. He didn't like it. He said, you've made this a den of thieves. And he, what did he do? He got mad. He flipped over the table. It was a righteous anger. He, he had a zeal for his father's house. So sometimes, uh, as being a pastor, it don't look real nice. So this here, it says, All authority be given to me in heaven on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yep. And listen to what he says here. Observe all things I have commanded. And lo, I am with you always. I, I need somebody to get this in them today. I know we don't always feel him. I know the enemy tries to come in and beat up your mind and tell you these things. These this is the letter, the words of Jesus. Lo, I am always with you. Even if you don't feel me. Even when, you, when you're down and, and broken and you don't feel like that nobody cares about you and you've been rejected by society, you've been rejected by your church. Role. He says, lo, I am still with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There, there's just certain things that we have to get in us. This is one of them. There's many a times I just said, I got this, this scripture, you're with me always to the end. I know I can't feel you. I know I don't even feel your presence, I know, but I know you're there. I know when I walk up to somebody and begin to, begin to do deliverance, or I, I know that, God, I know you're there. I know you're with me, even though I don't feel you. But he says, even to the end of the age. He says, I'm going to be with you. He's not going to leave you. Some of y'all need to know, you, your mothers and fathers and uncles, and aunt, they may have abandoned you. Jesus will not abandon you. Amen. He will not leave you. He's always with you. You got to get that in you. Somebody need to hear that. And it's, it doesn't, this is a charge to believers. It doesn't say that you have to have a certain amount of schooling. It doesn't say any of that. He said, behold, go out and make disciples. Baptize them. You don't have to have a certificate to back. Go take them to the creek and baptize them. If you're a believer, you win a soul, take them and baptize them. That's all religious stuff that men, men may, you got to have certificates. You got to have, you don't need none of that nonsense. You don't have to have none of it to do the ministry of an evangelist. Win souls. Drive out demons. That's the ministry of evangelists. Baptize the converts. He said it. It's, it's the believers. All this other stuff is man-made. Certificates and all. well, I, I I need somebody. They got at least have five degrees, and they're thirty two degrees in ice cold. <laughs> and this is what we want. So that when we go search for a pastor, we I need you I need to interview you. Where you been in school? What you know? What you doing? I want to know. Well, can you heal the sick? Can you cast out demons? Can you can you disciple? Can you make disciples? Can you do that? That's what I'm looking for. Do you have the power in the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Is God with you? Do you live for Him? That's what I'm looking for. I don't care how many degrees you got. Them degrees ain't going to cast demons out. He can care less about your little piece of paper. <laughs> oh, devil, look. I got, you got to get out. I'm a pastor. I'm an event. You got to get out. See his paper? He's like, he'll laugh at you. No, he's looking on the inside. Do I see Jesus on the inside of you or not? Do I sense power and authority or not? That's what he's looking for. Now, we like our degrees, man. It makes us sound good. It makes you know, people think I'm smart. I done told you I'm a hillbilly. Always have been and always will be. Amen. So we see here... Um, And they didn't have to go any believers' classes to see if their salvation's legit. 
We do, all we're going to do a believer's class. I'm going to check them out, make sure it's all legit. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Don't have to do that. Authority, when we see authority in this here, um, it's called exousia. G1832, you all should have. It's sense of ability, privilege, force, capacity, competency, freedom, mastery, uh, magistrate, superhuman, potentate, token of control, delegated influence, authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, strength. More like, it's talking more like, um, like your president. Our president's got a lot of authority to pull a trigger on. I mean, he could start a war with a word. He has that much, that's what we're talking about, that's power and authority. That's, that's authority, the power he's talking about here. It's, it's, a, a, it's ability. It's a jurisdiction. He said, so I have all that. He said, I've got all the power and authority back now. See, a lot of people think the devil has authority and I can't do anything about it. But if you're a born-again believer, you have authority over the strongest devil. As a brand new born again believer, you have authority over the strongest devil. Why can't I cast him out? Because you don't know, you don't, you don't have faith for it yet because you don't have the knowledge of it yet. You haven't learned about it, but you're learning. And there's only one time in the Bible that authority is given to hurt man. That's Revelation 3, 9 through 6, or not, Revelation 9, 3 through 6. It says, then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. This would be during the time of tribulation. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like a torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Ain't that something? That's the time of tribulations. That, so that's the only time in the Bible, in the New Testament, that Satan is, is give, basically given authority. That's what say, he says. These locusts during that time that's given authority to actually harm man. And that is going to be, we say, what is, what is tribulation? The seven year, it is judgment on the earth. It's judgment for those that's rejected God. They'll still have an, they'll still have they'll be, they'll have the opportunity to be saved, but that'll be during the time of the Antichrist, and they will need they will be um, be beheaded for their faith. The Bible says. And look at look at Third uh, John. Chapter two, it says, "Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health." Just as your soul prospers. Do you see that? I pray that you prosper in all things and be in health. Just as your soul prospers. So your soul should be prospering. Your soul prospers by being here today. As you get in the word in you. And you're learning the truth of the word of God. Your soul is prospering. But he says look. As your soul prospers. He says I want you to be in good health too. He says I want you to be in health. That's God's desire. It's for us to be in health. And just as our soul prospers, so as our soul is prospering, as we're renewing our mind and renewing our soul by the word of God, and we're clean, we are going to, our health is going to get better, right? We're getting the word in us, we're renewing our mind, now we're walking in faith, now we're changing the way we speak, now we're taking authority over the works of the enemy, now we're starting to walk in divine healing and health. We're going to walk in divine health. Why? Because we're learning what the Bible says about it, what God says about it. When you know what he says about it and you believe it, then it begins to manifest in your life. So God's will must be that we prosper and be in health as our soul prospers. So before you can be in health, you may have to be healed. So you may, you may need a healing here today. So before you be in good health, he wants you healed. That's God's word. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. Okay. What's that? Oh. <laughs> Exodus 23, 25 says, So you shall serve the Lord your God. Look. So if you serve him, if you're God's servant, you say, how do I serve him? I don't know. Be a doorman. Vacuum the carpets. Help clean the church. You're, so you're using your gift in the house of God. You're serving God. Serve him. He said, if you'll, he said, so you shall serve the Lord your God. 
and he will bless your bread and your water. And the Bible says, and he says, I and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. This is a promise of God, that if you serve him and you put him first, that he will bless your bread and water and take sickness from among you. This is God, listen, he can't go back on this. You need a healing? Stand on, if you're serving God, say, Father, I thank you that this is done. I serve you. I thank you for blessing my water, blessing my bread, and now I'm walking in good health because your word says I am. Even though I may not feel like it right now at this moment, but I'm standing on your word because your word will come to pass. It won't return void. That seed begins to get planted in you, and that seed will come to fruition. It will bear fruit in your life, right, if you receive it. Matthew 6, 9 through 10, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We've talked about that. Is there any sickness in heaven? Is there any disease in heaven? None of that. He says, let it be done on earth. So you, you carry a spiritual kingdom right here on earth. Right here on earth. And he says, start changing things. Jesus was that example. His first disciples were that example. They, they, they demonstrated the kingdom. But like you know, they were rejected in towns, and they didn't demonstrate the kingdom in towns, some of them. They just knocked the dust off their feet and went on. We see James 1.22. Be, but be doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So if we're just, so you come into church and hearing the word of God is not you being a doer of the word. There's a whole lot of people who think they come in and they punch their clock every Sunday and they're being a doer of the word. No, you're being a hearer of the word. He says, don't deceive yourself. Doer of the word is hearing the word today, and then you're going out doing it. You say, oh, okay, this is mine. This is my authority. This is my commission. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go do it. Don't deceive yourself. We can lie to ourselves. We can deceive ourselves. And that's what he's saying. Those, like I always say, those things, the, the good works he's ordained you to doesn't save you. He said, there'll be many in that day that's going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons? Didn't we prophesy? Didn't we heal the sick? Didn't we da 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 Didn't we do all this, Lord? He says, depart from me, you worker of inequity. I never knew you. We do these things because we love God and we found truth and we want to share that truth with other people because we found this, we found this treasure, treasure that's in earthen vessels. We want to share it. We want people to be free. We want people to be healed. Why? Because God's kingdom is here now. So we share that good news. We share that truth. And if you don't, you don't believe. If you don't share the truth and you don't share God, you're not a believer. You don't believe. Because if you really believe it, you would go share it. If you really believe it, you would go out and pray for the sick. You might be here today. You've never been taught this. And you're saying, man, I've never been taught this. Well, that's okay. Today's a good day. You can start. Find some sick folk and pray for them. Amen. Amen. Call them up on the phone. We've seen people healed over the phone. Cast demons out on the phone. So we got, I mean, look, there's, there's so much we can do. It's just apply your faith to it. Believe that you have the authority to speak to whatever that is and, and make it happen. So don't deceive ourselves. Be doers of the word. That's what I love about the book of James. James is very direct. He's very straightforward. He don't sugarcoat nothing. He don't beat around the bush. He said, this is how it is, and this is how it's. I mean, I love the book of James. He's just straight up. And uh, too many times we try to sugarcoat stuff to please people, and it's just people just need the, they need the raw truth of the Word of God sometimes. They just need, what does it say? I don't, I, listen, when I go to church somewhere, and when I'm going visiting somewhere, I don't want it watered down. I want that preacher to stand up and say what the Bible says, because if he don't, I'm not going to be real happy. When they, when, they, when they bounce around scriptures, and when they go around, and I'll go ahead and say what it says. First, uh, was it first? I think First Corinthians six nine. I heard a preacher quote that, and I said, "Well, go ahead, and, go ahead and read what it says." This fornicators, idolaters, homosexuals, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. Liars, all it goes into all this stuff. First Corinthians six nine. But he just quoted the the numbers. A bit, I said, "No, go ahead. This is a big church. Go ahead and go ahead and say what that scripture says. People need to hear it. Why? Because it's truth." Wait, 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 you don't see that's I don't like that. Click. I'm done watching you. Preach what the scripture says. 
is people need to hear it. That's why people are bound. That's why they're lost. That's why they're in those lifestyles because they haven't heard the truth. And they got to hear it. And it's just, if you, and it's like if you love people, you tell them the truth. If you love people, you tell them the truth. If you don't and you don't care where they go, you don't care if they go to hell, then you lie to them. And that's just, a, that's how I know if people's telling me, you know, if they love me or not, they're telling me the truth. When my men in the church, when they come up to me and they get in my face, they say, Pastor, I think you, you know, you might need to say this or you might need to say this. You might need to change some things. I know they love me and they care about me. When they say, Pastor, I need to talk to you for a minute. I hold them accountable. They hold me accountable. And I say, okay, I'll listen. Look, I said, I want, I want correction. If I'm in the wrong or if I don't say something that maybe it's in the flesh and it's a little too bold or whatever, because I ride that line sometimes, I said, let me know. Let me know. And I respect that. Why? Because then they do because they love me. If they didn't, then they wouldn't love me. They're just going to let me run off in a reel and run off in a ditch. Does it make sense? <clears throat> so we see here. Matthew 22, 35 to 40, says, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, tested him, and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. If, listen, if you are sick, would you want your neighbor to come pray for you? Then you need to go pray for your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? I don't know whoever's in Walmart. Whoever's, your neighbor is whoever. Wherever you're at at that time, whoever's next to you, that's your neighbor. So, you, so if you love people, if you would want somebody to pray for you, and when you're down and out and you're depressed and you're, you're, and you're having a bad day, you want somebody to prophesy over you, prophesy over somebody. Prophesy the word. Be of, be of good cheer. The Lord is with you. He's, he's not going to leave you nor forsake you. Begin to speak life. Speak God's word over them. Prophesy over them. Encourage them. Lift them up. So you do unto others how you would want done to you. And if I was sick, and if I knew somebody had faith for me to be healed, I would want them to come pray for me. So I want to do to others as I would want done to me. Does that make sense? Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is a law and the prophets. Um. So let's look at some stuff here. What is divine healing? And we'll close out here in just a little while. Divine healing is not God directing the doctor's hands. And like I said, if you're religious in here today, I'm probably going to bust a few of your bubbles. Uh, divine healing is not, um, it's not connected to exercise, diet, or nutrition. It's not divine healing. Divine healing is not immorality. I'm sorry, immortality. Immortality. You take one letter out, I'm telling you. It's not immortality. That means you still you can be healed, you're still gonna die one day. So what it is, divine healing is for you not to die before your time. There's many people die way before way too young. Even church people, even people that love Jesus. Why? Because they didn't they didn't know about healing. They knew God, you know, they believe God heals and all this stuff, but they they never really knew it. It wasn't really in them. You see what I'm saying? They, they, didn't, they didn't have an understanding of it. And, and look, I, I'm not sitting there saying I have it all. Look, we've, we've prayed for people that's, that's come from the dead, and we've prayed for people that's died. We've prayed for people that hasn't been healed. We've prayed for people that has been healed. But we see the increase in numbers every year. We see, an, we see, it, we see things, it's, it's continuing to go like this. Why? Because as we're learning, as the truth is growing in us, as God is connecting the, the word together and everything is beginning to come together now, we're going, we're going upward. So that's the main thing. We're going in that direction. So we don't have it all. We don't, have, we don't know everything. But we'll teach you what we know because I know it works. I've seen enough to know it works. We just got to keep working it. Amen. Whether I ever see anybody healed or not, I'll continue to pray for the sick. Why? Because it's God's commandment. It's, it's a commandment. That, he, he, that is a, a sign of the believers that they lay hands on the sick. So, um, divine healing is not immunity, although immunity is promised to Christians. We can walk in divine health. When you get a hold of the, a lot of the scriptures that I'm giving you and the teachings and uh, watching the power of the tongue and you begin to incorporate this in your life, you'll notice that you, you know, if you're somebody that gets sick a lot, you'll notice that you may not, this thing start falling off, you know. 
Um, and that's something I practice every year. I mean, the only thing, I go to the doctor one time a year, and that's just to have my blood work done. That's it. See what I need to pray about. What I need to pray about. So, I mean, uh, do things try to attack me? Yeah. Do I go through some battles? Yeah, but I keep standing. I keep praying. I keep pushing. But I can tell you, I walk in more divine health now than I ever have. Because I'm applying the word, I'm watching my tongue, and trying to practice some of those things. It don't, but it don't happen overnight. You don't turn a ship around overnight. It takes time. It takes thinking. It takes diligence. Um, because that, that is granted to us. <clears throat> Divine healing is the power of God working within a person's body to remove sickness or disease or to repair the, the part of the human body that has been affected by sickness, disease, or demonic influence. That is divine healing. Can God use a doctor? Yes, it, God can use a doctor. But that's not divine healing. That's just divine prayer. Amen. He can, you know, he can put you to a good, good doctor, a good surgeon. If you don't have the faith, maybe you're not there to be healed. God, God will make a way. That's what he's got doctors for. Because maybe you don't have the faith for it right now, for divine healing and belief. And so God will use a doctor to heal you, you know, as far as uh, doing surgeries or whatever it may be. So it, it just shows that God wants you healed. That's why he's got doctors here. But that is not divine healing. Do you understand? That's just God, you know, and God can use that doctor for whatever to help you. But it's not divine healing. Divine healing is divine power from God. Hits your body and just heals whatever's in there. That's divine healing. That's divine healing. And God, but that, that just shows you the love of God that he loves the blessings on America that we have doctors and we got hospitals and we got pills for pain and we got things, I mean, that really help us through these things. But God's ultimate goal is for us to rely on Him in the end. And that's, that's where myself, that's where I'm working, is, is to just fully rely on God. My resources, my finances, my family, the whole nine yards. That's where we want to work. And how do I do that? By applying this word. By applying this word. So, um, and don't ever get, look, if you've got to go to the doctor, go. Don't ever get in condemnation. Or, that's what they're there for. They're to help us. And there's good doctors out there, just like good, there's good preachers out there. But there's also bad ones too, you know, and just like there's bad preachers. So you got, you got both ends of the spectrum. So um, <clears throat> you just you continue to do what you do and pray about things. I always pray about everything first, you know. Um, <clears throat> so we see that um, everyone Jesus healed later died. Even Lazarus, he raised from the tomb hey, four, four days dead. He still died. So it just keeps us from going for our time. Like I said, we're no good in heaven. We, we, we've entered into eternity. Our race is over. Our race, look, I want to live as long as I can for the glory of God. For the glory of God. To, to burn at both ends, burning for him. And that way we can reach people. We can preach the gospel. And I, look, I'm never going to retire. I might, get, I might not be a pastor forever, but I'm not. Listen, I'm gonna, I will preach the gospel. And look, I might, they might be at my funeral. I'll still be preaching in a casket. I'm going to preach the gospel. Amen. I'm going to preach. Um, as long as I've got a voice. And we're going to proclaim the truths of God. So, <clears throat> let's see. And that, now, if a person continues doing what they did to get sick, the first time it may come back on them. So, whatever whatever lifestyle it may be, if you continue in that, it'll come back on you. I'm just I'm just giving y'all some little nuggets. Same thing if you had a demon. If you had a demon, we cast it out, and you go back to doing what you're doing to get that demon. Guess what? He's going to come back in. And guess what? He's bringing seven more buddies stronger than him. He ain't playing. He ain't going to put them same chains on. He's going to chain you up so you don't get away. So, and everybody says, what about the sovereignty of God? The great thing about the sovereignty of God is that he does not go against his word. Ain't that cool? He's not going to go outside the boundary. He ain't going to say, no, I'm not going to heal you because uh, I just don't feel like it. He has to. Because the word says that by, your stri by his stripes you're healed. That he sent forth his word. Do you see that? Do you see that? So divine healing does not affect or interfere with the sovereignty of God. It actually establishes it. We see the thief Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus came to bring life and that more abundantly. We should be operating in the overflow of God's joy, peace, and presence. 
when the enemy of the thief comes in, Satan tries to come in and kill, steal, and destroy, we act as Jesus' ambassadors to stop the thief from accomplishing his goal by bringing the abundance life Jesus came to provide. This is the body of Christ enforcing God's sovereignty, just as a policeman enforces a city's sovereignty by enforcing the city laws. Definition of sovereignty is the supreme power of or authority. And I come by to tell you the Supreme Court is not the supreme authority and power over God, over us. Amen? God is the supreme being, supreme authority. Just because the Supreme Court approves of it doesn't mean God approves of it. You need to get that in you. One holding supreme independent authority over a region or a state. One that does not have to answer to another in the governing of its affairs. The Father don't have to answer to anybody else. <laughs> he, he's the creator, amen? amen? Kind of like us as an embassy, if it represents the United States of America. Um, so, in a good way, the U.S. has like embassies in like Africa and different places like that. On the outside of that property of the United States, there could be Famine, no water, disease, I mean poverty. Listen, they could be poverty falling apart around them. But on the inside of that embassy, it looks just like the country that it represents. Do you understand that? They could be starving on the outside of the embassy. In the embassy with America, say America is a blessed nation. All the delicacies, all the food, all the supplies, they have all the same stuff. In that embassy that they've got here. The finest steaks. The finest food. Everything. Everything. The luxuries. The water. The electric. All the amenities that America has. Has in that country. Even though that country don't have it. In God's kingdom. You have all the amenities. That all of heaven guys. No matter what this earth and this world looks like. Wherever you go. That kingdom resources are available to you wherever you're at. Do you understand that as ambassador? The Bible says we are ambassadors for Christ. We are representatives of his kingdom. We need to start representing. Because I don't think in the past 30 years we've been doing a very good job of representing Jesus. Placing judgment on people. Listen, he hasn't called you to judge people. He's called you to set them free. I don't care what lifestyle they're in. I don't care what they come out of. I don't care if they're homosexuals, what color they are, what they're involved in, drug addicts, whatever, whatever prostitute. It is irrelevant. My job is not to judge them where they're at. My job is to preach deliverance to the captives and set them free by the power and the authority in the name of Jesus and let him do the rest. Does that make sense? Amen. We're going to set captives free, and we're going to do it because God's raising up an army. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise. We're done. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. So what we're going to do now is get into some prayer and some deliverance. And um, I know some, some, there were some that wanted some deliverance.